Last March, federal agents charged six people, including two physicians, with running a pill mill and selling illegal prescriptions out of empty clinics in Columbus and Valdosta. For the first special report in our series on prescription drug and heroin abuse, we hear from people who experienced addiction firsthand. Also, local investigators working to put pill mills out of business, plus our exclusive interview with a prosecutor connected to the Anna Nicole Smith overdose case. It's easy for me to say I hurt and they write me a prescription. It's easy to fake. Most prescription addicts do doctor shop or they buy other people's prescriptions. It was easy, says Joshua Dudley, a former drug addict in Columbus. You can go and tell a doctor that you had lower back pain, you know, and he would write your prescription for 180 um, Roxy's. You know, that's like a really strong pain pill that you can just break down, snort. Michelle Atencio also found drugs wherever she could. Now out of jail and clean for the last two years, the Columbus native used to grab plenty of prescription painkillers. And they were readily available, you know, and it was, you learned how to take and use one or use the other and kind of make a combination that worked for you. One time in the ER, the doctor gave this junkie a warning. And he said, look, he says, I'm not going to sugarcoat this with you. He says, if you keep this up, you're going to die. But a small percentage of health professionals don't have the patient's or the addict's best interest at heart. If I can give a doctor $300 to write me a prescription and he's never seen me before, it's greed. Muskogee County Sheriff's investigator Johnny Ellerby describes a pill mill as a medical official or facility prescribing or dispensing narcotics without a legitimate medical purpose. And one of those massive pill mills was run out of the Relief Institute of Columbus in 2011. That's according to indictments this year in Albany, Georgia's federal court. Prosecutors there say the so-called clinic dispensed millions of oxycodone and hydrocodone pills to patients from Florida to Ohio. It's either doctors or nurses, PAs, anybody that can get a hold of a prescription pad. People want to pretend like it isn't a problem, sort of the not in my backyard kind of issue. John Niederman helped prosecute doctors involved in Anna Nicole Smith's overdose death. The Los Angeles County Deputy DA says it's not just addicts conning doctors, but also some health professionals and pain clinics giving meds with no questions asked for profit. That's why he traveled across the country to give tips to police and attorneys at the National Prescription Drug Summit in Atlanta. How to target the doctors who truly are issuing prescriptions illegally. Clearly, uh, many of these operations are, are really reselling the pills, so that's drug dealing rather than folks who really need the medicine. Georgia officials, like the state's attorney general, tell Newsletter 9 taking down pill mills is a priority, but it's not easy. To convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that a doctor is guilty of a crime for what we perceive as them acting within the normal scope of their everyday business is it's a difficult sell to a jury. It is less than 1% of 1% of the population of doctors and pharmacists, but they are the ones who are feeding into the community far more product than is ever appropriate for practicing good medicine. But we have certainly made arrests where several hundreds of pills have been involved that belong to other people. Drug agents tell me even a, a small bottle of narcotics like this could go for hundreds and hundreds of dollars out on the streets. Here on the fourth floor of the government center in downtown Columbus, there's a drop-off box where you can go and take your unused prescription drugs. And patients are not the only ones being held accountable. An orthopedic surgeon would have an average of 189 uh, pills per prescription. Pharmacists talked about it for workshops at the summit, where we also sat down with a national leader for the Drug Enforcement Administration, which regulates 1.6 million physicians, pharmacies, manufacturers, and distributors. His simple message to them? Folks, you're part of the source of this issue, so you need to be with us as a solution on this issue. Are they cured because you refuse to dispense? Are they going to the next pharmacy or are they on the street looking for it or are they getting heroin? We're seeing the doctor shopping and the illegal prescribing as the beginning of the problem that leads down the road to further problems. And as more pill mills go under, users are shifting from painkillers and street drugs to heroin because it's as cheap as 10 bucks for a hit. Entry, yeah. though, depending on the drugs. Doctors like James Sirleaf, who leads the Columbus Midtown Medical Emergency Department, know how their prescriptions can indirectly have deadly consequences. They try not to overprescribe, but there's also fraud. Just this week, 
I was called by a pharmacy, somebody had taken my, my license and DEA information, and they were calling prescriptions and narcotics in my name. Pharmacies have successfully been using a tracking system, which is why you have to show your ID. Certain drugs are restricted, partly to prevent overdoses, according to a California pharmacist. Hydrocodone was rescheduled to be more controlled a couple of years ago, um, and then in California we started tracking tramadol. Law enforcement also have ideas on how to prevent these pill mills or doctor shopping. There would have to be some kind of computer database that says, Jason Dennis has been to this doctor. So when he comes to this doctor, it says, hey, you've already been over here, so we can't see you. There have been reports of music icon Prince struggling with opioid addiction for years, even days before his death. In our second special report, you'll meet a former drug dealer from Columbus, plus a mother and father who buried their sons and how they all turned tragedy into action. The statistics are staggering. In 2013, more than 46,000 people in the U.S. died from drug overdoses, according to the DEA. That's more than car wrecks. As evidence mounts that opioid pain medication may have played a role in the death of music legend Prince, here's my second special report where we introduce you to a mother and father who buried their sons, also a former drug dealer, all who face demons but have turned their tragedies into awareness and action. Three parents, one of them from Georgia, a former drug dealer and addict. One of my kids just said, you know, Dad, you probably shouldn't be around. You know, you're a junkie. The other dad and mom mourning the loss of their children to addiction. Curl up in a ball and you go into a fetal position because your world just got rocked. Wayne Campbell's oldest son, Tyler, facing injuries as a college football star in Ohio, was prescribed post-surgery painkillers like Vicodin. Soon after, there was addiction, Stints in rehab, then Tyler got hooked on heroin. And within 12 hours of leaving the rehabilitation facility after a 30-day stay, I mean, overdose and died. So people are going from sniffing pills to sniffing heroin. The National Institute on Drug Abuse cites recent studies showing nearly half of young people who inject heroin reported abusing prescription opioids first, in part because heroin is so much cheaper now. I've just seen the horrors of heroin use. My middle child, Aaron, uh, overdosed and died on from a heroin in October of 2013. And he was starting quarterback for his high school football team. Aaron's mom says he first experimented with marijuana, eventually losing his battle with heroin at age 20. Since then, Justin Phillips spends her days urging parents and students to not ignore the red flags. I didn't know how strong the addiction is from your almost immediate use and how simple it is to die. And the world just keeps going on around you and you're just sitting there. You just, what just happened? You know, you raise your children. It's, it's our job as parents to protect them. We've lost a generation. Nancy Hale also didn't know what to do when her son got addicted to drugs. He survived, but she's now involved in this fight as CEO of Operation Unite in Kentucky, which organized the National Prescription Drug Abuse Summit. That's what I would tell parents. Uh, use the grief, use the pain, uh, use to help others. Well, I do not want anyone to have to experience it. It's just amazingly difficult to lose a child, and it will stay with you forever. But this has helped, and I've been doing this almost immediately since he passed away. And the This is starting Overdose Lifeline, a nonprofit which raises awareness of opioids and heroin addiction for families. This is why you should invest your dollars in us doing this prevention program. Their educational program for 8th to 12th graders includes a video called This Is Not About Drugs. It's hard to concentrate when you're an addict because you just want a fix. It's Their stories serving as raw warnings to fellow teenagers, while Overdose Lifeline also offers alternatives to using drugs and alcohol in dealing with stresses and pressure. Drugs don't get you far. They gonna get you in a casket or locked up in prison. And there's no integrity and there's nothing left. There's just satisfying that monster. That monster for Neil Richardson was cocaine and for 30 years. He called himself a functional addict who owned a business in Miami. Neil's side job was selling drugs. He hid coke in his freezer to take a break from the world. And I'd be crawling the streets at night trying to get some more. Once Neil's kids rejected him, he found a way out of his addiction by turning his life over to the Lord. God set me free from my addiction. To whom much is given, much is due. And so I do a lot to be focused on paying it forward. 
I heard there's not going to be any classes. Doing that now as the Muskogee County Jail Chaplain and Executive Director of Safe House Ministries, leading inmates and addicts through faith-based 12-step programs. This dad's focus has also changed. I was just wanting to sit, you know, in a corner and do nothing. For a bunch of bad ideas, being vigilante as it's going to take care of all the drug dealers to have a, you know, a golf outing memorial of, those weren't going to do anything. And this idea of educating our youth and community about the dangers of prescription pills. One of the biggest warnings given at this national summit in Atlanta is for parents to lock up your medications because you never know if it's your son or daughter or a guest at your house trying to take these prescription meds that are not theirs. There's also an organization at this expo called SafeRx that has these locking prescription vials. They're hoping that pharmacies will be using soon to keep the meds out of the hands of kids. I don't think most parents understand that it's directly related to heroin. After his son's death, he honored number seven on the football field by creating the organization Tyler's Light to support those battling drug abuse, helping youth do more than just say no, but to speak up and save a life. Denial is a powerful, powerful mechanism that we all use, but it is, I believe, what allows these young people to die. And so we have to really break through that denial and get parents and caregivers to talk about it. Some of us know some of these going, are you kidding me? She's really doing well? Yeah. And so I used to get high with her, or I knew him back on the streets, and so he's successful. Certificates from recovering addicts filling the walls of Safe House at Rose Hill Methodist Church in Columbus. Chaplain Neal says the ingredients to success include an honest person who holds you accountable and crucial follow-up. Oh, going to treatment doesn't fix anything, it buys time. Next, in part three of my Ending the Epidemic series, we focus on a solution that's saving lives, the overdose reversing drug naloxone or Narcan. And there are reports it was used on music legend Prince. As we continue our series of reports this week on prescription drug and heroin abuse, we focus on one solution, the life-saving drug naloxone, also known as Narcan. It's used for people who overdose on opioids, some virtually dead, reversing 10,000 overdoses between 1996 and 2010. There are reports it was used on music legend Prince. A Columbus doctor explains how it works, and a former drug dealer describes how he tackled his addiction that could have killed him. Did you take any medicines today? Were you using any drugs? Dr. James Surleaf is the emergency department medical director for Midtown Medical Center in Columbus. He's seen numerous patients rushed into the ER after overdosing on drugs, sometimes bringing them back to life with a drug called naloxone. It reverses the effects of opioids, everything from prescription painkillers to heroin. A lot of people say, oh, well, I survived, and they go back into their communities and amongst their friends, and they, a lot of times we've seen people come in multiple times for these overdoses. Naloxone is controversial, though, because some wonder if it's enabling addicts who overdose. I remember being just extremely high and blacking out. I had already stopped breathing numerous times. Your fingers turn purple, your lips turn purple, and you, um, you know, you're, you're slowly dying. I'm not proud of this fact of saying that it's happened more than a few times. Um, but it has. Overdosing on opioids and heroin on the brink of death 10 times, Christina Parnell told our sister station, Fox 6 in Birmingham, she decided to get help. But on her way to the treatment center, this addict used one more time, ending up in the hospital. And once again, she was brought back to life in a matter of minutes. It's almost like if you're in a, in a deep sleep and then all of a sudden you just wake up. Um, and I started shaking uncontrollably. The drug that saved her every time, naloxone or Narcan. Because of heroin overdose deaths doubling nationwide, 140 in Jefferson County, Alabama, in 2014 alone, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder has called for more police officers and sheriff's deputies to carry naloxone. Close to 20 states, including Georgia, are following that recommendation. With overdosing, they stop breathing and go down into the 80s. We got here. Pop superstar Prince, who died last month, was reportedly taking Percocet, which contains the opioid oxycodone for hip pain. Sources close to the legendary musician say a treatment with the anti-overdose drug naloxone saved his life a week earlier. Naloxone came to effect and has saved probably millions and millions of people around the country.
The alternative to not using it? Brain damage and death within minutes of an opioid overdose. When naloxone is injected, it can work within just five minutes and essentially wakes up the person that overdosed our narcotics, but it does not replace emergency medical care. I joke about it, you can almost revive the dead because people are so, they're almost blue, and you give them nar Narcan and they wake up of this communist sleep. While many physicians admit the majority of drug overdose victims will relapse, their job is to do no harm. Then it's up to the patient to get clean. You know, people have to also take responsibility. Is this something that they want to continue? To Not only do doctors use naloxone or Narcan here in the emergency room, but police and medics from all over the nation and here in Georgia also use it when they respond to emergencies. Across the U.S., some states allow or encourage schools to stock the heroin overdose antidote naloxone. Pastors, family members, and friends of addicts are also receiving training on administering this drug, which would be prescribed to the person in need through a new University of Alabama at Birmingham program. This is my son, Aaron Sims. He was 20 years old. Immediately after he passed away, I was fortunate enough to be part of a pilot project where I learned about naloxone and I learned about the lack of resources. Justin Phillips' son died from heroin addiction in 2013. Named for him, Aaron's law was signed by Indiana's governor just last year, allowing Hoosiers to get a prescription for naloxone if they believe someone they know is at risk for an opioid overdose. Prior to that, only emergency workers could carry that drug. His mom's organization, Overdose Lifeline, provides naloxone to first responders, families, and caregivers. Sometimes we give them Narcan, but the, the, the drug is so much in the system that sometimes we have to breathe for them. And so you generate a tolerance where you need more and more to feel the same way, and there's no ceiling. In a workshop at the National Prescription Drug and Heroin Abuse Summit in Atlanta, this health scientist for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. John Zibel, was one of hundreds of experts talking about the destructive transition between the two kinds of drugs and how to prevent overdoses killing so many people nationwide. So we really have to get people that aren't becoming dependent on opioids to just to, to end that even risk for heroin. Former Columbus drug dealer and heroin addict Joshua Dudley barely survived his habit, wishing naloxone could have saved more. I had half a dozen friends you know, that have shot up heroin and died, you know, and there was times when I was like, you know, that could be me. We've talked pill mills, victims, and saving addicts' lives. Now in part four of my Ending the Epidemic special reports, see what's being done at the state and community levels to battle prescription drug abuse. We are also investigating what's being done at the state and community levels to battle prescription drug abuse. In Georgia, there's been a 10% increase in drug overdose deaths from 2013 to 2014. And Alabama tops the nation in the amount of prescriptions per 100,000 people. Leaders near us hope to learn from what other states have done. I smoked pot at 10 years old. Joshua Dudley was raised in church, but narcotics took over his life for two decades in Columbus. Just started using uh, opiates and uh, pain pills and eventually heroin, you know, and it just got worse and worse. And I was in a dark place. We've had explosions in the heroin overdose rate. Up 300 percent in the last three years in northern Kentucky, according to that area's drug control policy director. And it really cuts across all demographics. And I think that that's really been a big part of the awareness because it's really gotten out of that urban core and into the suburbs. We've lost a generation to prescription drug abuse in southeastern Kentucky. It hit personally for Nancy Hale, who leads Operation Unite, an organization tackling illegal drug use. Her son got hooked on drugs, but survived. And they got involved in their community, learning quickly that the plague of addictions where they live was similar in Atlanta, New York, and everywhere. Because let me tell you, what happens in Georgia affects us in Kentucky. We have an epidemic in Georgia. Uh, we lose over 700 folks a year to prescription drug abuse. States with the highest rate of people showing up to licensed drug treatment programs where the primary drug is a prescription opioid. The dark colored states, including Alabama, had the most problems back in 2001. Then Georgia was included a few years later, then the entire U.S. covered. The top five drugs in our state for overdoses are Oxy, Xanax, Hydro, Methadone, and Methamphetamine. Georgia Attorney General Sam Mullins tells us putting someone in prison does nothing to stop the addiction. So for the last five years, Georgia has focused on criminal justice reform, 
adding accountability courts with alternative sentencing for nonviolent offenders. We don't need to be paying for them in a county prison or the state prison. We need to get them help. The treatment center is key. And keep in mind, a lot of the folks that start with opioids then go to heroin. Treatment did work for Michelle Atencio, who used drugs for nearly three decades in the Columbus area. She says many people just don't know there's help out there. You know, the first thing everybody thinks is, well, I don't have the money to pay for that. There are places out there that will take you in and help you get into recovery and, you know, get a better life without paying a dime. In this area right now, we have several. Valley Rescue is free. There's a waiting list, but usually they'll put you to work at the shell, at the mission. Here in downtown Atlanta, one of the main themes of this National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Summit is that it's not just about bad people doing bad things. In fact, the U.S. Surgeon General is here, and he said that addiction is not a moral failing, but a chronic illness. I know as a professional pharmacist that this is a disease. It is a weakness. Speaking at that drug summit, U.S. Representative Buddy Carter of Savannah told the crowd doctors need to follow rules, but it needs to be a team effort. It's got to be the federal government, it's got to be the state governments, it's got to be pharmacists, it's got to be physicians, it's got to be nurses, it's got to be family members. When we're doing community-based work, that really makes a difference in our, in our, uh, throughout our state. His job is leading behavioral health prevention in Georgia. Travis Fretwell is preaching education in cities and neighborhoods. I think certainly it's about citizens as well as state officials. I think it's an opportunity for us to take these initiatives and begin to push and advocate for uh, proper drug disposal. Along with taking out those pills and dealers, there needs to be genuine drug and alcohol education programs for younger children. That's the advice of former drug dealer Neil Richardson, now executive director of Safe House Ministries in Columbus. He's had success with faith-based 12-step programs. There's got to be a spiritual component. If, if this is a war, and it's not, we're not strong enough to win it by ourselves. That people are really set free from the bondage of addiction through this testimony. Behind bars for a second time, Joshua says he gave his life back to the Lord and has been clean for two years now, not even craving drugs anymore. I just prayed, and, and, and he took all the temptation away from me. You know, I was selling drugs, like destroying lives, and now I'm, I'm giving hope. He now hosts Bible studies and ministers to homeless in the valley through the nonprofit Take the City, telling others how he overcame the heroin habit. Jesus will take that away from you. You know what I mean? There's one step. It's Jesus. There ain't 12 steps. And one vital step for state leaders is to catch people like Joshua before they get stuck in the drug world. Our goal ultimately is to prevent things from happening. But in the event that they do, we want to be able to provide the appropriate treatment. Leaders in Kentucky and Georgia say they're meeting with physicians, judges, jailers, advocates, and police to determine really how to help these addicts. And needed to understand what, what the counties could do in terms of increasing treatment, uh, increasing naloxone. You need to work with the doctors so that they fine-tune which patients really need opioids and which don't. With 40 Americans dying every day from overdosing on prescription painkillers, President Obama has proposed $1.1 billion in new funding to help those addicted. In my fifth and final Ending the Epidemic report, the President's plan. 40 Americans die each day from overdosing on prescription painkillers, and the CDC calls it an epidemic. It's prompted President Obama to propose $1.1 billion in new funding to help those with an opioid use disorder. We caught up with him at the National Prescription Drug and Heroin Abuse Summit with 2,000 attending in Atlanta. In the fifth and final part of our Ending the Epidemic series, we tackle the president's plan plus solutions from others. <laughs> On stage, alongside a doctor and two former drug addicts for a panel discussion, President Obama had plenty to say about the epidemic of opioid and drug abuse, including his role as a father to a pair of teenagers. Their ability to access legal or illegal substances is very high. And the president the says this requires an all hands on deck for, approach. For example, the the U.S. Surgeon General drugs. agrees, joining him at the National Prescription Drug Abuse Summit. And opioids are devastating our communities and they are costing us lives. And we cannot afford that any longer. The only way that we reduce demand is if we're providing treatment and thinking about this as a public health problem and not just a criminal problem. It's not bad people doing bad things. 
my older son Brian struggled with drug addiction for many years. And after being clean for a full year, 25-year-old Brian took his own life in 2011 out of shame from how others saw him as an addict. His father, Gary Mendel, still struggles with it. Some of the best times just aren't as good anymore. You know, when family gets together with that empty chair and Brian's not here, it's really difficult. It feels really good to know that we're helping others, but it still doesn't take away the hole in my heart for Brian. He left his successful business and started Shatterproof, hoping to spare other families from being shattered and aiming to be a national organization to fill the void for this disease, like the American Cancer Society, but for addiction. And if it takes us cracking the whip to get everybody to sit down at the table together. A national leader with the Drug Enforcement Administration tells us they need help from pastors and other community leaders to take their streets back. The DEA's job? Start that process by taking out the biggest, baddest drug dealers and bring in some calm first. We can't just stop with enforcement. We have to rip out the drug trafficking groups and then say, folks, there needs to be treatment. There needs to be education for kids. And it turns out it's cheaper to get heroin on the street than it is to try to figure out how to refill that prescription. You got a problem. You know, we are working very aggressively with the Mexican government to prevent an influx of more and more heroin. And we're working with our state and local police in Georgia, in Alabama, and other states around the country. We're having an impact. The DEA closed out April with National Drug Take Back Day, where the Muskogee County Sheriff's Office collected 100 pounds of unused prescription pills in just one day adding to the 3,000 pounds they've collected in the last 12 months. We're very focused on reducing the number of people who die from an overdose related to opiates. I don't think this is as difficult as everybody says. Mendel's solutions are similar to the Attorney General's. Change public perception of addiction, collect more data on drug-related deaths, then he believes the President or Congress need to act tomorrow on passing new laws, one to offer more medication-assisted treatment. But I do believe that federal government is moving way too slow. Why isn't there a federal mandate or legislative action that says every doctor in this country, you must check a, a patient's history before you prescribe? Shatterproof has helped pass legislation on that in 10 states so far. And their next target is Alabama, where doctors prescribe triple the number of painkillers as some other states. But after those pills do their damage, President uh, Obama says the federal government the needs to invest more to help addicts, not just lock them in jail. And we have proposed in our budget an additional billion dollars for drug treatment programs in counties all across the country. This is a nonpartisan issue that demands all of us to work together for an immediate solution. Hoping for quicker solutions, Dr. Vivek Murthy is releasing a first ever kind of report from the U.S. Surgeon General's office. And our 2016 report on substance use, addiction, and health will bring together the best available science on prevention, treatment, and recovery. And even though he admits doctors are in a tough spot, the Attorney General plans to launch a 50-state call to action to health professionals to improve prescribing practices with 250 million scripts written for opioids every year. That's enough for every adult in America to have a bottle of pills and then some. The doctors in the VA are out of control. They are prescribing too many opioids at too high of quantities, and this needs to be stopped. We're setting out to change behavior, and we're going to use this indicator. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is taking a new hard line urging doctors to avoid prescribing powerful opiate painkillers for patients with chronic pain. We got 60 medical schools who've signed up and who are announcing today that they are going to make pain relief a major part of their curriculums. The president and another father also agree Narcan needs to be in the hands of more EMTs to save the lives of those overdosing. Naloxone should be everywhere tomorrow, not in six months, not in nine months. For complete coverage of this prescription drug and heroin problem and solutions, go to the Ending the Epidemic section of our website, WTVM.com, and all these special reports will also air next week on Newsletter 9 at 11.